Welcome back, everyone. So for this session, uh, we're going to talk about German Expressionism, and then after the break, we're going to go to Futurism. So we start in Germany, and then we go to Italy. And the way this class is structured is that German Expressionism, in, in large part, looks to the past. Um, and Futurism looks, as you can imagine, encoded in the, in the term itself, looks to the future. Uh, and that's not the only way that they're opposed, that they're diametrically uh, uh, in opposition with each other. Ideologically, there are all sorts of ways in which uh, they, they diverge. And so we'll talk about that a little bit um, today. But let's start with German Expressionism. And there are, there are two groups that we talk about when we talk about German Expressionism. Der Blau Rider, the Blue Rider. Uh, and we're going to talk mainly about Kandinsky and Franz Marc, though there were other artists associated with the Blau Rider. Um, Kandinsky begins in the Jungage stil, uh, begins in the Art Nouveau style that we talked about with Vienna Secession for our first class. Then we'll move on to Die Brücke, which means uh, the bridge. Uh, and that's headed mainly by, uh, not mainly, but by four artists, uh, but Kirchner was probably the most famous. So we'll talk about those four for the first half of, of class. Uh, before we get to those groups, though, I do want to address Willem Warringer, uh, who's a pretty important, I mean, historical figure in, in art history. He writes a, uh, a book called Abstraction and Empathy in 1907, Abstraction and Einfundung. Uh, and there, your, your text makes quite a bit of this, um, this book, especially since people like Kandinsky and Franz Marc were reading him and were influenced by him. But I think you'll notice from the text that the the influence is somewhat, I mean, in, in some places it direct, it's direct, but it also doesn't quite fit all that well in other instances. So I don't think we're going to talk too much about it because I found in class when we talk about these works, when we talk about these two movements of German Expressionism, it doesn't really have that many legs. Like, it doesn't really go that far, um, and maybe it's just a little too academic, uh, a little a little too arcane. Uh, so it might come up over the course of, of the works that we talk about here, but um, honestly, I don't think it's all that fruitful, um, at least judging from the way I've taught this and had reactions from students in class. But uh, that being said, it is important to know what Warringer was saying. So um, the... The thesis of his of his book, um, and in some ways it is quite quite new, um, is that there's basically almost a, um, a a universal condition of art that would go back for him. I mean, to like um, Paleolithic uh, prehistoric art, uh, and it falls under two different camps. So one is the impulse to abstract, the impulse to have works works of art or at least visual culture that looks abstract, like it doesn't look like the natural world. It's the opposite of, of, a, of a naturalism, so it's more stylized than abstract. That's on one end, and on the other hand would be empathy. And we'll talk about empathy in a slightly different context with especially Franz Marc in this class, but what, what Warringer meant by empathy was that artists sort of had a natural engagement with the natural world, like they empathized with it um, in such a way that then the works of art were naturalistic. Like they looked like the the natural world. And so on the one hand, we come back to our, the famous Gribo mask that we talked about on, with Cubism on the left there. This we would describe as somewhat more stylized and abstract, whereas a work that, uh, here that comes from the Venetian uh, Renaissance, uh, this would definitely be more, um, definitely more naturalistic. And so Warringer reads almost like a psycho, um, has like a psychobiography or, or a psychoanalysis of, of style here. So he says that cultures, art forms that are abstract, they have a difficult uh, and uneasy relationship with the world. So there's abstraction for him uh, represents a type of, of uh, disorder, chaos, um, and above all, like uneasiness, like things are not right with the world. Whereas, if you have a style that's empathic, that's naturalistic, like the example on the right, then he says that's, that's a condition of the culture being at peace, um, uh, being at ease with the, the natural world. And so for this, this is in flux, because uh, we're going to see in this class that 20th century modern art is, is definitely moving and gravitating towards the abstract. 
Um, and so for many art historians, this is an interesting thing. It's, a, um, it's actually a, a form of development. But if you follow Waringer's thesis closely, you realize that, oh, well, he's saying that modern art, the will to abstraction that we see in Kandinsky or in Kirchner that we talk about today, that actually reflects an uneasiness with the world around them. And so this is where Warner might make a bit of sense with theories of the city and of modernity and technology as something that's alienating, something that, that creates uneasiness, um, and that we might be able to find in some of these paintings that we look at today, especially the painters of Die Brücke that show us a world, usually an urban world, that's anything but easy and empathic. It's actually, um, um, it gives us an uneasy vibe. So that's a brief encapsulation of Warringer's uh, thesis. Um, and if you, if you find it to be interesting, and if you find uh, um, interesting parallels and connections where, where Franz Marc and Kandinsky and others were actually reading him, and you can actually see it in the work, then all the better to have started with this uh, brief introduction. But let's get to some of the, the, the nuts and bolts of these two groups. So we'll start with Der Blau Reiter. Which calls which which uh, can be translated was translated to the Blue Rider, and this is in reference in loose reference to uh, Revelations um, and um, a history of of, of Christianity, um, and in fact the the cover of the Blue Rider is uh, like a, a form of folk art based off of, of, of pretty celebrated images of Saint George. Slaying, uh, slaying a dragon. So right off the bat, you're getting the sense that here is a group that in some ways has spiritual ambitions for art. And by spiritual, I think we should mean not so much, not so much like religion. Um, like Kandinsky doesn't, like if you read Kandinsky, it's not really like he's talking about Christ and Christianity or Judeo-Christian traditions. But um, more, um, he has a conception of art as more, uh, as having ability to, to, to to afford the viewer um, a spiritual access, uh, r uh, access to some sort of spiritual world of creativity, um, of imagination, and, and of joy. There's something actually quite joyous, uh, for the most part, about Kandinsky and about Der Blau Reiter. Um, and so they're like uh, the artists we discussed in Primitivism, this could actually be an extension of that, uh, that lecture. The way in which Kandinsky and Franz Marc um, and, and others who were part of Die Brücke, the way they sought to have access to this more spiritual uh, realm, which, which would be the opposite of, let's say, um, a crass, materialistic, uh, modern um, conception of the world, um, where everything is reducible to making money and to science uh, and to just like materialist causes, right? Um, the opposite of this would be like returning to a more spiritual understanding of what it means to be um, <clears throat> a living thing and especially a human being. Uh, though with Franz Marc, you're going to see that he opens the equation to other forms of life. So that's the way you want to understand the spiritual with, uh, with Der Blau Reiter. And one of the ways they tried to access this is, yes, through non-objective, abstract uh, forms of painting. Kandinsky is one of the first painters, not the first, but one of the first painters to paint almost wholly non-objectively, almost wholly abstractly, which means that his paintings don't show you anything that corresponds to the world. It's just the pure imagination and play of color, line, composition, and form. Um, so that's one of the ways they try to tap into this more sort of spiritual realm. But another is to go back. And this is where we talk about German expression being in some ways uh, a, a modernist, a modernist avant-garde that taps into much older traditions. So I already mentioned the cover of the De Blau Rider Almanac as being an instance of folk art. So they're interested in folk art. Uh, so non, you know, like what today we would call maybe de-skilled or outsider art, um, they're interested in that. Then they're interested in non-Western visual culture for in many of the same reasons that like a Gauguin or a Picasso or a Matisse were, because they thought it gave them access to a spiritual realm that was outside of the West, the crass materialist West of the early 20th century. Um, they're also interested in the art of children. Uh, so the way in which children are creative, it's as if it's argued, um, Der Blatter Rider would argue that in some ways that creativity is untainted by uh, adult civilization and um, 
um, and sort of the stifling effects of morality and so on and so forth. Um, they're also influenced by animals, especially Franz Marc. So the idea that somehow through uh, non-human animals, uh, through the creaturely realm of existence, you can you can tap into a certain type of imagination or spiritualism, like a pan-spiritualism, um, through nature and through animals, um, that that can somehow afford you um, a, a way out of the of crass Western modernity towards something more spiritual. So all of these things are working in tandem. And you can find them all within this very important publication, the Der Blau Rider um, Almanac from 1911. So here are just a few pages. So what you have are examples of, of all these forms of art, all these forms of creativity that I've just laid out for you, um, along with uh, writings. Um, writings about quote-unquote primitive art, writings about folk art, and so on and so forth. So this was a, uh, almost like a, a really important source book for Der Blau Rider, uh, but not only for Der Blau Rider. It's an Im important text. And if you want to see the whole thing, all these pages are basically cut and paste from MoMA's website. Uh, and MoMA does a really um, beautiful job archiving their works online. And uh, you can go and flip through the pages of the, I think, you can go in and, and flip through the whole pages of the Der Blau Rider Almanac, which would be a very valuable um, a very valuable first edition of, of the book. Um, you can just watch it on, sit, look at it online. And so how did these interests translate into art, into paint? Well, for Kandinsky, by and large, it had to do with abstracted, simplified, uh, um, simplified shapes. And here, with three writers from 1911, you do get maybe uh, something of uh, a naturalistic representation. Maybe you can read these lines here as three horses or three forms um, sort of um, riding along a landscape of some kind. But in some ways it's a bit of a stretch because by and large the, the feel you get from a painting like this is just the primacy of the color, the primacy of the movement of the line, the primacy of the composition. Um, and while there might be some correspondence with the quote-unquote objective world, by and large this feels like a non-objective painting. And if you read Kandinsky, um, for him, what his art should do was elicit a response in the viewer. Like he, he thought that the um, this is pretty forward-looking in some ways. He thought that the, that the, it was the relationship between the viewer and and the artwork and the artist that created the condition for a more spiritual, um, a more spiritual um, interpretation or more spiritual experience. Um, so that that's one way to explain the non-objectivity of Kandinsky's work. Um, and I think maybe you could read in a childlike wonder. Um, most people will say, most lay people, and I often get this from like students when I first show them at Kandinsky, they think, oh my goodness, why would anyone like this? It looks like a kid, a kid could do it, right? Um, and maybe that's true, although probably not, uh, because these, these, type, these types of work are always much more methodical than they first appear. Um, but that actually might very well be the point. If Kandinsky and Der Blau Rider are interested in the inherently, let's say, uncorrupted creative energies of children, then it would make sense that they would try to tap into that with their, with their paintings. Um, and notice, it's not, a, it's not a coincidence that in the, th the, the three big blobs of color right in the center are the primary color. So there's something very foundational about Kandinsky's non-objective painting here, um, which might tap into um, the, art of, the art of children. Uh, and here's a quote from him, so it will help us uh, to read directly from the artist's um, the artist writing. So he insisted that the very contents of his art are what spectators live or feel um, under the, 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 the direct form of the form and the color and the combinations of the picture, and that this leads to um, a spiritual experience or have a spiritual quality which will run counter to quote unquote the whole this is where you get the their investment very very clearly the whole nightmare of the materialist a attitude which has turned life in, of the universe into an evil purposeless game so i think you can tell what the ambitions are for his work uh, that this is this is countering uh, the crass materialistic modernity that they're seeing all around them um, especially in urban spaces that's not the last time we'll, we're going to talk about this um, and throughout all of 20th century art, it's certainly not the last time this thematic will come up as a concern for artists. So if you're interested in Kandinsky, go ahead and read 
there are really nice excerpts of his concerning the spiritual art of art um, from 1911, a very famous text, um, which is widely available. Um, so if you like Kandinsky, look it up. Um, I also want to mention the, the, the connection with music here. So Kandinsky and Schoenberg actually had a relationship. Uh, Schoenberg is a very important modernist um, composer um, who we, we could have talked about, and I think we did talk about with Vienna Secession. Um, and so there are an interesting parallels to, 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 to play here between Kandinsky's abstracted work and Schoenberg's atonal work, which, if you don't know anything about Schoenberg and atonality and his form of composition, it was a radical departure from, um, from Western forms of composition based in a 12-tone um, system that, like Mozart, Beethoven, um, uh, Bach, and all these incredible composers in, in Western music history were using. So it's a radical departure, and he's using sounds and tones in a completely new way. Um, and I think you're seeing a correspondence here with Kandinsky, who's using uh, color, composition, uh, line, um, form, and pictorial qualities in ways that are that are quite novel for the history of Western art. And notice the the way he describes art as as simply, um, well, not simply, but as an effect from form and color. Um, like it's like almost a purely formal experience. Uh, one that doesn't nest that doesn't have to correspond to or be subordinate to the outside world like the form and the color doesn't have to look like something it can just be itself um, as its own quality if that doesn't sound like a definition of music um, then I don't know what does music almost inherently except for certain examples is is, is tonality is quality is timber um, it's a composition that ha that affects you in some ways but in a way that's not mimetic, it doesn't represent the world in any ways. Its own qualities are the things that, that affect you. Uh, that's why we love music, and that's one way to approach Kandinsky's um, work. So the other uh, Der Blau writer is Franz Marc, and he's one of the great uh, animal painters um, in, in history. Um, and, but he has a completely different conception of painting animals. So these are it's very famous uh, large blue horses. So you have these four blue blue horses that seem to be, their bodies are like rippling and echoing the, the natural world and, and, and the landscape. Um, again, with these very vibrant colors, not unlike Kandinsky, um, and verging on abstraction. Though this is less abstract than, than Kandinsky, I would say. Um, so Franz Marc, maybe it was less about children and folk art and quote-unquote primitive art, but he was above all interested in the natural world and animals. Um, animals were a um, major source of creativity and fascination for him. And then we can get a text, uh, we can get a quote from, from Mark to, um, um, to see this. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, um, but because you can, you can just pause it and, and, and read it for yourself. Uh, but basically what he's trying to get at here is that He's fascinated by animal minds, about other minds, about non-human minds, and trying to understand how one might be able to see how they see the world. Um, how do we get a picture of the way animals see nature? So rather than um, focusing on the way humans see the world, um, animals included, he's sort of turning the tables and asking, okay, well, we're not the only minds in the world. There are other minds out there. How do they see the world, right? Um, um, and are we just imposing our way of seeing the world when we assume certain things about non-human animals, right? So Franz Marc is getting to a certain key question about other minds, about, about animal minds, um, non-human animal minds that are other than us, uh, that, that only a few decades later uh, and into the 20th century and then much later in philosophy, philosophers and ethologists will be asking and will be studying, right? In 1911, they really have no idea about um, how other minds really work. And so Franz Marc's work is interesting uh, because um, he's trying to tap into the way animals see, see the world. And he's not alone. So he's influenced, um, or a fellow traveler would be someone like the poet Rilke, who wrote a really beautiful set of poems called the Dueno Elgis um, in 1922, but he began them in 1912, right around this time. And he has a theory of the creature of the animal as, as having access to nature and access to the world in total, in total openness, total completeness. 
Um, for Rilke, animals are not burdened by civilization, by culture, by technology, by all these things. Um, they're not inhibited at all. They're free beings that see the world for what it is in this like beautiful, open, expansive way. They're directed outwards. Whereas for Rilke, human beings, they're constantly looking inside, they're constantly thinking about other things, they're constantly held back by culture, civilization, um, and other concerns that they're actually closed to the natural world. Um, these are all contested ideas, right? Um, but it's still it seems to be very compatible with the way de, uh, de Blau Ryder understood these creative energies of not only children, you know, maybe children, they would think, were more open to the world, and once you become an adult, you get closed. You stop caring about all these, these things you, you maybe cared about as a kid. Um, but it also fits with this idea of animality as inherently more open to the world, whereas it, when, you, when, when you're too human, um, you, you close inside yourself, and you're too preoccupied and mired with culture and civilization and modernity. Um, so Rilke fits really well with, uh, with this discussion we're having. And the last thing I'll say about Franz Marc and, and uh, Der Blau Ryder is that uh, it's just to give a, a, a counterexample. So this is this is a realist work by Rosa de Bonheur, French painter, very very famous. Um, she's an incredible painter. She's one. Of, she's she she was a, she was a woman, but she painted in these large genre scenes that usually only men uh, painted at the time, and she also uh, loved animals. And so she's showing you um, these cows that are plowing. Um, the field, right, in um, in France. But this is very clearly a painting from the point of view of a human, namely the farmers uh, and namely the painter herself, right? It's almost in some ways, uh, it's a realism that verges on, the, on like um, the photographic, right? You don't really get the perspective from the cow plowing, plowing the field, right? You're getting access to the world to this very naturalistic, very human, um, anthropocentric conception of the natural world. Well, when you go to Franz Marc, you get something completely different. This is where you see the clearest difference and sort of the inspiration he had um, when it came to, um, to animals. This is this very famous yellow cow. And it's not pictured in your book, but I bring, in, I bring both of these in because they're so clearly different from each other. This is naturalistic. This is quote-unquote objective, which is really a, you know, a human-centered view of the world. Whereas this one, you're almost, it's impossible to do, of course, but Mark is trying to give you the, the, the world from the perspective of the cow here, um, of, of, the, of this dairy cow here, who has these sort of fantastical uh, colorations. So she's yellow, and we know it's a she, not only because of the udder, uh, but Mark has had this whole color theory that certain colors were masculine, certain colors were feminine. Um, there's a whole emotive range in his theories of color, and yellow was feminine. There's this purple, uh, purple patch uh, on the body of, of the cow, um, and the cow seems to be jumping or emoting in a way that does not seem natural, um, and is in a landscape that also doesn't seem natural whatsoever. There's something abstracted. So for Mark, the recourse to color, to form, to line, to abstraction is a bit different from Kandinsky. Mark seems to be interested in using it for us to then empathize a bit with non-human existence, with the creaturely, uh, with the animal, right? Um, as if you're getting a, a view of the world not through our eyes, but maybe through the eyes of this cow. Um, who seems to be at one with the landscape, who seems to be in some ways jumping for joy. Um, um, in this very, <clears throat> let's say, sort of subjective experience of, of, of the world that would be foreign um, to our eyes. Um, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting way uh, and shift of, um, uh, an inter interesting shift of, of depicting um, animality. Um, and if you've ever seen videos of dairy cows, dairy cows who have been um, taken out or let's say um, um, rescued from uh, dairy farms, um, where they're often uh, cooped up and hooked up to machines and they can't, they actually can't really even move uh, when they when they're uh, retired or or rescued and put in a sanctuary. It's it's interesting. There are all sorts of videos online where they're sort of jumping and acting almost like dogs. 
um, in a way that's completely foreign to us because we normally just see them as these large laboring beasts um, who are either like hooked up to machines or plowing fields, right? Uh, which is very human centric. Uh, but when you see them sort of jumping for joy in a pasture, um, it, it, it approximates more Franz Marx's vision of the non-human world um, than, than this one, right? So um, it's all in keeping with their Blau Rider's ambitions. But I don't want to sell. Um, I don't want to say that Mark is is only in that Franz Mark is only into animality in the sense of of joy and freedom and so on and so forth. For the most part, his his animal paintings were about um, despair um, and violence and pain. Um, so the fate of the animals is is definitely one of those. It's this abstracted form. Uh, of animal painting, you have horses, you have foxes, you have a deer in the center, you have pigs, um, or boars on the, on the lower left here, um, and something is going wrong. Um, you even have the movement of like a desaturation of color uh, from left to right. It's as if there's this cloud um, and this, this dark energy that's moving from right to left on the canvas. And abstraction itself seems to be piercing the bodies of the animals. In this uh, in this painting, so if <clears throat> excuse me, if in the yellow cow you have this painting as a form of empathy and joy, here, like the book, I actually like the way the book um, uh, writes about this. Uh, here they chose the the, the limits of empathy. Um, we empathize with pain and suffering because we also suffer. We also feel pain like any other animal, uh, <clears throat> but there are limits to accessing it. Um, we can't quite know. Um, um, what it feels for, for other creatures, um, though I think we can guess. Um, and so here, abstraction, we, we get to a certain limit uh, of understanding. Um, at least that's the way, I don't think that's the way Franz Marc would have, would have thought of his painting, but that's the way it's interpreted in the chapter. Um, so that's good for uh, German Expressionism. Now let's finish with Die Brücke. So the other um, German Expressionist um, movement. Um, so, whereas Der Blau Rider is based in Munich, Die Brücke, the bridge, um, is based in Dresden, and it's founded um, until they moved to Berlin, but it's founded in Dresden uh, by Fritz Bleil, Eric Heckel, Ernest um, Kirchner, and Karl Schmidt Rodloff, uh, four architectural students who become really dissident architectural students and then start their own, start their own group. And like so many Avant, historical avant-garde movements, they published a manifesto. In our second half of class, we're going to talk about the most famous manifesto, probably, of the early 20th century, which is the Futurist Manifesto. But De Bruca also published a manifesto. Here is the cover of it. Um, so it says, Art Group De Bruca, and it has an image of a bridge over an abyss. So keep that in mind, because that comes from a very famous uh, quote from this guy. Um, one of the more important 19th century philosophers, Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote a really influential book called The Spex Zarathustra. Um, and one of the more famous quotes in the book is this one. Man is a rope tied between beast and over man, a rope over an, ab over an abyss. So they're referencing this, this bridge, this rope over this abyss, directly in their, um, in their manifesto. And for Nietzsche, what this meant was uh, that that man, that human being in his present form in the late 19th century, uh, for De Bruca it would be people of the early 20th century, is not a, an endpoint in history. Um, in fact, for, for Nietzsche and for De Bruca, the way people were living, um, and they will probably say the same about us, the way that people were living, they were um, only a pale shadow of what humanity can be. Um, and so this sort of pale shadow of what humanity can be, you know, like um, for, for Nietzsche and for De, De, De Bruca, this would be um, uh, people living and working and only caring about money, uh, um, uh, completely materialistic, um, losing sight of all that's, that's uh, interesting and noble about, about, um, about humanity, like literature, like art, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, for for Nietzsche and for De Bruca, they were really harsh about their contempor about contemporary people. They thought they were just um, 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 completely inferior for lots of different reasons. And so, for Nietzsche and De Bruca, this is a condition to overcome. 
um, you want to get behind it. Uh, so Nietzsche says in the, the, the Spake Zarathustra, what's great about man is that he's a bridge, not an end. What can be loved in man is that he's an overture and a going under. So this is where we get to the theories that were really quite min misunderstood of Nietzsche's overman or superman. Um, the idea that man is something that um, um, we can get beyond. Um, and there's a conception of the human that's much better, um, much more noble, much more interesting, and so on and so forth. So this is the way that de Bruca read, um, read Nietzsche. Um, and they thought they wanted their art uh, to lead to this new conception of humanity, one that would not be mired in modernity and a slave to technology and a slave to material forces. Um, and so on and so forth, it would be a more creative sort of, you know, this is quite utopian conception of, of, of the human. And so they too took recourse to youthful energies. And this is the manifesto. It's a very short one. Uh, we, call on, we call all young people together and as young people who carry the future in us, we want to wrest freedom for our actions and our lives from the older, comfortably established forces. Um, and so they had a conception of youthful energy as overtaking, as going beyond the present uh, stultifying old rearguard um, social forces that they saw all around them. And of course, they lived it. They lived this life. Um, this is a picture of Kirchner with his wife in his studio. Uh, notice, we talked about Kirchner already in the primitivism section. We, he has an um, um, African statue in his studio, so he collected them. Uh, his studio looks like uh, almost uh, um, it looks a little bit like uh, Gauguin's uh, um, um, living, quote unquote, living native in, in Tahiti. Um, and you have these Japanese umbrellas that we, we that we know shows up in his girl under a Japanese umbrella, um, and then all the pornographic. Uh, images, uh, like pretty sexually explicit images that are on um, on the wall. And so the the theme of sexuality in De Bruca, um and naturalness and nudity um, and freedom, uh, especially sexual freedom, also in some ways fits in, fits in with Nietzsche's Zarathustra um, and Nietzsche's whole philosophy. So one of the key aspects of Nietzsche's philosophy is that he is one of the first to really criticize um, the Judeo-Christian conception of the human body. So for most of um, religious history, at least Judeo-Christian um, religious history, the body is something to sort of be kept in check, even maybe despised, like sexuality is sinful, um, um, sex is a, is a temptation, is a sin, so on and so forth, especially of course outside of, of matrimony. For Kirchner, for Heckel, um, and for the De Bruca, this is this is antithetical to the way they want to live their lives. They want total sexual freedom. Uh, they want to be able to to go out into nature, be naked, um, and and almost um, uh, again, this is almost like a paleo conception of of life to go back to this sort of natural. Uh, wonder and uh, oneness with nature. So here's a, a woodblock print of Kirchner. It's a pretty famous one. Bathers throwing uh, throwing reeds. This is an actual scene. Like they would go out into the country. They would get naked. I think people do this today. It's called like forest bathing or something like that. You get naked and then you just lie down in the forest and it has supposedly therapeutic effects. Um, I've never tried it, but uh, it's a thing I hear. Uh, this is definitely something De Bruca would have liked. They would go off into the countryside, they would, they would play the nudist, and they would frolic in, in nature. Um, so this is in keeping with the whole wider ambition of German Expressionism. Um, and then they would also, here's another Woodbach print by Eric Heckel, they would also um, draw uh, and print pretty, you know, pretty sexually explicit images um, often of, of women. So again, the idea of the, this conjunction between going backwards, primitivism, and the female form, not in every case with Di Bruca, but a lot of times, is centered and focused on the, the female body, as it is, again, in girl under a Japanese umbrella. So with the theme of nudity and sexuality and freedom um, and despising those who despise the body, it's very much within um, their reading of Nietzsche and, and Zarathustra. And, by, and just 
in, in, a, in a larger context, just this idea of breaking with European morality, which is such a common feature for so many of the historical avant-gardes, uh, beginning with Gauguin and now running through uh, the German Expressionists. And so we'll end with uh, probably the most famous picture of of the German Expressionists, and that's Kirchner's Street Dresden, which MoMA has. So if when it reopens and it's safe to go, almost um, it's almost um, sure that they'll have it up. This is one of their prized um, paintings, although it might not be. And this is Kirchner's Street Dresden. And this is the other side of the equation then. So if some of the, with these works were shown freedom, um, nature, sexuality as this instinctual um, 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 natural thing, we have the opposite here. Here we have a, a view of the city as a very stultifying, oppressive, alienating place. There's a wonderful quote by George Simmel that's in your text where he describes the urban dweller as developing this organ um, of protection. And I, I like to translate that in more uh, everyday terms as just, you know, when, when we all know this, although I think, it's, I think this pandemic is probably going to change this. I think uh, it's going to change this. But, but one of the cliches of, being, of living in a large city uh, is that you would become jaded, you would become cynical. You'd be able to just walk by people even if they're suffering or homeless um, or whatever it might be, right? It's just understood that you live in the city and that you need to have this protective shell where you don't feel um, as much as maybe you would at home um, um, or with the people you already know, but you, 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 you become kind of cynical and jaded. That's one way to translate this protective organ that George Simmel, an early sociologist, um, describes this, the city as inducing in, in humans. Again, I think this might actually change, um, um, and we might actually be seeing it change in this large um, anti-racist uprising, um, global anti-racist uprising um, currently, although that's a big claim to make, but it would be an interesting discussion if we were having, if we were having class. But in Kirchner's time, in 1908, this is definitely still a conception of the city as alienated, um, as actually even a, like a, a visual assault, a cacophonous visual assault, not only at the level of color, where this is where we get the name. It's funny, I've given this whole lecture on German Expressionism without saying what Expressionism actually is, um, although in, implicitly I've been, I've been laying it out for you. But Expressionism it really comes out of Van Gogh uh, through many of the artists we've talked about um, before, and it's coming through here in Kirchner, Kirchner, which is the use of color and form in a very expressive way. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. Um, that's what it is. Form, color, abstraction, um, not so much to represent the world in an objective way, but in almost a subjective, expressive way, where it's, it's, you're seeing the world, but also you're, you're, it's, you're feeling certain emotions um, that the artist and maybe some people in the picture are feeling. Um, so you have this undifferentiated crowd of people who seem to be separated by this orange electric filament that, that runs through the crowd. Then you have these people in the front. These are, uh, because of their hand gestures, a lot of scholars have noted that we know for sure they're prostitutes, because prostitutes, at the time, it wasn't, it was, it was controlled um, and uh, illegal in certain parts. And so they had to make these covert gestures that they're available. Um, and so the way they're holding the dress um, means that they're open for business, that these two prostitutes are open for business. And so you, like Manet's Olympia, you're getting um, right in your face um, one of the key challenges to, to modernity, which is the, re the, the reduction of the human body to simply a crass materialist resource, like using the body simply for an economic exchange. This is so far from the the... The, the, the more sexually free, natural relationship with the body that you get in some of their other works. Here, this is a, an image of sexuality as economic uh, materialist exchange, which is alienating in some ways. Uh, and he, fur he, 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 he goes even further with this, where the, the, it's like they're wearing masks. Um, you actually don't quite see their real faces. They're just these masks looking at you in what a lot of people um, describe as somewhat like freaky. Um, it's, a, it's a very strange, imposing look, um, as is this guy's, uh, who might be, you know, like he might be out for a stroll. 
uh, picking one of these ladies up. He's kind of looking at looking at you with this uh, strange grimace. Um, it's just really, really stilted and bizarre and, and um, maybe anxiety inducing, um, as are the colors. And then the, the, the weirdest part of the painting is the little kid uh, who seems like maybe she's being held by a parent or something like that, but you can't quite see. Um, so the kid should just be plopped in the middle there alone. Um, doesn't seem very happy, um, has a toy, um, is, is holding a toy in her hand, but otherwise is just kind of sitting there, standing there, uh, staring at you. Um, so it's a very, very bizarre, bizarre scene. Um, and so this is where we can end coming back to Warringer. Maybe this painting does work with Warringer. If Warringer thinks that expressive abstraction um, and uh, um, um, painting that verges on the non-objective is reflective or symptomatic of a society that's now uneasy with itself, uneasy with the natural world, as so many of these city dwellers seem to be in Dresden, uh, then maybe it, maybe Warringer's thesis makes sense, um, that this expressive style in Kirchner is an expression of uneasiness, alienation, um, and maybe even, even despair. So this is the kind of scene that Die Brücke wants to overcome. Um, through freedom, through youthfulness, uh, through creativity, and through art. Um, so, quite ambitious um, as a as a as a group of artists. Okay, so let's take our break, and then we'll go to futurism. <laughs> 